So maybe I should take myself off mute. I was going to say. I was going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, of course always an honor when I get to sit down and talk to to the national ambassador for for young people's literature, Jason Reynolds. I am uh, Ibram Kendi. I'm a professor at at Boston University, and uh, together we created Stamped Racism anti-racism and you which is a remix of stamp from the beginning um and really chronicles the history of of racism um, particularly anti-black racism for young people and you know obviously there are many people who are in pain today and many people who are angry today and i suspect there are many young people who are pained and angry over what happened in in Wisconsin, what has been happening for months, what's been happening for years. Um, and, you know, Jason, what do you think people should be, what should parents, what should caretakers, what should young people be thinking right now, you know, as they, as they witness everything that's happening? Yeah, I think it's, it's a fascinating time. And yet not fascinating. I mean, it's, it's a familiar time, which is also strange um, and a frightening time. And I think, I think the first thing is that I think it's okay for us to acknowledge and um, honor the fear that young people have. It's a warranted fear. Uh, and I think that's that's the first thing. We as adults, I think our our, our knee jerk reaction due to our love of our young people is to um, do everything we can to sort of fix the problem, right? As it pertains to the way they feel about a particular problem, even if that means we're not willing to fix the problem that has caused them the pain, right? And so I think it's a fascinating conundrum that most of us find ourselves in because typically what happens when a young person comes crying to you, your, your knee-jerk reaction is to, is, is to stop them from crying. Uh, and if you can stop them from crying, then, then you feel like you have a success right, that there's a victory there. But truthfully, it's not about stopping them from crying. It's about figuring out how to dismantle the thing that has caused them to cry, how to change the thing that has caused them tears, right, caused them pain. And I think right now, I think it's important that we acknowledge their pain, but I think we also, as adults and as young people, have to figure out together how we can, how we can, uh, you know, alleviate the pain in a way that feels substantial uh, and I think that's what you have been trying to do in, in your sort of work and career. I think that's what I've been trying to do in my work and career is figure out ways for us to engage around these tough conversations um, so that these conversations then grow legs and move around the world uh, and become action. Um, and I think action is necessary. <laughs> I think today we're all feeling defeated. And I think in the midst of said defeat it comes, comes, uh, comes vengeance, right? And that vengeance isn't always, when the word vengeance comes up, it's always like, you know, violence, right? Or, or like people, people's knee-jerk reaction, they get turned off by the word vengeance. But by vengeance, I just mean retaliation. And by retaliation, I just mean uh, a response to the thing that is that is causing harm. That, that response could very well be conversations around how to become uh, more anti-racist. It could be, it could be conversations around policy law. It could be conversations around protests and strikes like we're seeing in the NBA. Um, like retaliation just means a response. Right. And that, and that, in that response is uh, is a vengeance, but that vengeance doesn't have to be a bloody vengeance. Um, it just has to be an active one. Yeah, and I, I can imagine that many young people are, are feeling, in a way, some of the same fear and paralysis as older people, in which they see this happening week after week, month after month, and it's hard for them to even think about where the end could be or how we could bring this to an end or um, how this even came to be. And, and I think that's why we ended up, you know, writing this book stamp because I think it can, can allow young people and older people to realize how it came to be that so many people could fear black people, mm. could fear unarmed, 
black people? How is it that blackness arms people when they're unarmed? How is it that people can still be considered dangerous when they're walking away? How could somebody, a cop, view somebody as dangerous when they're with their three young boys? You know, how, how can this be? And, and it's because of, you know, racist ideas. And if there's a single racist idea that has been extremely dangerous really since the founding of this country is it's this idea of the dangerous black bodies, dangerous black people who live in dangerous neighborhoods and who are so violent and criminal like. And, and so therefore we need this massive policed state in order to control these people. And then we um, send these police officers with these racist ideas into those communities and we arm them to the teeth. And then we give them, complete immunity almost when they harm and kill these people. I mean, what else is going to happen other than what's continuously, you know, happening. And then I think about sort of the, the, you know, the, the parallel component in this particular moment, as we watch the NBA strike Mm -hmm. in response to, to this, to this uh, shooting is if you look on the internet, there are people who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there are obviously, and the internet I know is the internet where they are, you know, a cesspool of trolls, right? But there's, the, there are, that, you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, we all know what the internet is about, but there are thousands and thousands of people who are like, it's, it, leave the protest to the protesters, just play the game, just play the game. And it's this idea that on, that just like there's the, the, the sort of, the archetype of the violent black body, uh, there's also this, this other sort of narrative that is, that is racist. That says that the that the black body is meant for entertainment, um, yeah. but that it but that but that but that it should be separated from its humanness. Yep. Uh, that it is meant to sort of serve to bring joy into the lives of the people who view the black body, the black body dance and and swing and play and 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 war. Right. As long as as long as they aren't um, as long as they aren't humanized. As long as they don't have feelings. As long as they don't attach themselves to the, to, the, to the body politic, to the whole of who they are, uh, then they're safe and they're okay over there. And to see those players stand up and say, "No, no, we we are him, right? And, and he is us, and we are uh, we are exceptionalized. Uh, and our bodies, as like Chris Webber said, when he goes to the store, he doesn't have on a suit. He has on sweatpants and slides and a t-shirt, and not everybody knows who he is. And in those moments." It's a very different, he's having a very different experience. And I think all of this dates back to the things that we talk about in this book. I mean, we're talking about going all hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years back to when yeah. these sort of, um, these, these ideas came to be. Yeah, and it's, I, it's, I, I, I think it's, we also sort of draw the parallel between how people can then can justify thinking that these athletes, these black athletes are sort of these physically superior people and they they don't really have to work hard. They don't really have to practice. They don't really have discipline. They're not really in, incredibly sort of gifted intellectuals on the court or in the field. It's just that they you know, have these incredible bodies. And that's why they were able to, to make it as if we don't regularly see people who are six, five, six, seven, walking around, not in the NBA, right? Um, <laughs> but in many ways, we view these athletes as almost like animals. And for the better part of American history, black athletes were called animals. And when we think of animals, we, we think of we distinguish animals in that when an animal is angry, an animal is dangerous and vicious and an animal doesn't have self-control. And so that's how not only, so that's then how black people, everyday black people are viewed as animals by police officers. So they always have to be on guard, right? They always have to be pulling out their weapons, even when black folk ain't got no weapons because they just never know what these animals are going to do to them. Mm. And, and even 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, you know, Tamir Rice, 
are, are viewed as, as animals who police officers have to jump out their car and as soon as they confront them, they start shooting and killing them. And, you know, I, I, I think that I, I want young people to, to realize that despite what these people may think of you, you're not an animal. <laughs> you're a human being, just like the people who don't look like you. And and we show in this book how and why it came to be that people would view you, you know, in that way. I love that you, you know, sometimes when we do these talks, you, you, you say this, 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 this adage that I think is so poignant and brilliant when you say, you know, America uh, sees black children uh, as adults and, 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 and treats black adults like children. Yeah. Right. There's this sort of there's an interesting sort of there's an infantilizing of the black adult. Like these athletes get infantilized, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and and black children um, are, are are turned into grown-ups far before they are. I mean, I was a black boy who was, you know, very quickly seen as a as a grown man at, at the age of 15 mm -hmm. years old. You know, I want to give a little bit of context because I I don't want to uh, be present even though the book has been out since March and you know I I'd like to believe that everyone has read it. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would like to believe that everyone has read it, but I do just want to say really quickly, um, there was a reason, there was intention behind this book. You know, there are lots of YA books and there are lots of adaptations and so forth and so on um, of tons of brilliant books, right? Brian Stevenson, I mean, we, we could go on and on and on about all the, the adaptations. This is a little bit different um, because of because of the intention behind it and because of what, what we were actually trying to do. Sometimes it is not enough to just pare down a piece of text and, and say that this is for young people, right? I think that sometimes in order to make something for young people, you have to actually make it for young people. And that is a very different narrative and a very different way to think about um, what what are you drinking, bro? What, what is that? <laughs> What is that, man? It's water in there because you don't drink oh, nothing else. It's water. Yes, it's my like, thousand, one thousand liters. I'm literally giving this. I'm giving a diatribe, and you're like, <laughs> let me grab my five gallon. Tank. Let me grab my tank of water. <laughs> but, but you know, in all jokes, I mean, all jokes aside, I, I think it was important for us to try to figure out how to make something specifically for capital F, right? Something for young people, meaning it had them in mind. Uh, it was written with um, a pace that felt connected to the pace of their lives and their attention spans. Uh, it was written in a language that they're familiar with and an informality without being pandering or placating. Um, and, and, and honestly, for me, it was all about figuring out how to make something so that when our young people get older, they are armed with information. I think that, I, and I am, I am an emotionalist, right? I am somebody who lives my life on the emotional ledge, right? I am a person who uh, is 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 all heart and usually very little mind, and I just kind of just do my thing and kind of bump around the world in that way. And it served me in certain ways, and it's hindered me in others. And I think when it comes to conversations around race and politics and these kind of things, I get so angry and I get so emotional that sometimes I can't get to um, to a to I can't get to a healthy discourse because I'm just so upset and I'm so passionate and I'm so, and, I, and I'm in such pain. And I think for me, my, my 18 year old little brother, I would love for him when he's 36, 37, 38 years old to be able to engage in these conversations with, with emotion, but that emotion can be, um, that emotion can be harnessed because he also has so much information. Right, and that information is what he can lead off with. The emotion and, and, and the passion behind how he feels is what is what brings him to the conversation. But the thing that actually anchors that conversation uh, is the information that he will be armed with because of a book uh, like Stamp. That that's what I wanted. You know, I think sometimes we get in these discussions. Next thing you know, we're, we're all yelling at each other. And I think sometimes we could yell a little less if we knew a little more. I agree, and 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 I think that we already know our, our young people are hungry for this information. They're serious about transforming their country. I've had some of my most probing, you know, conversations, you know, about my work, uh, going to high schools, 
as an example, or even middle schools, you know, talking about about this book and the questions that young folks would would ask. I mean, they would be so piercing and so direct and so to the point, um, and so much about transformation. Um, because you know, once you arm them with that information, then they're ready to essentially go to battle, go to battle for their world, go to battle for black people, go to battle for the future. And, and you know, what else is beautiful, more beautiful than a young person who is battling for another world? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that, and, and not just sort of flailing, but literally, you know, very strategic and, and, and recognizing the sources of power and, and pushing on those sources of power and, and all the while recognizing that the problem is that power, is the policies, is, is not you know them. I think about when I was a kid, I was, when you were talking, I was just in here <laughs> thinking about when the first time I heard the story, Where the Wild Things Are, right? Uh, and this is this is uh, Maurice Sendak, you know, and this is the kid, Max. He, he's, you know, he's go, he goes off into some other world and he, there are all these sort of the, the monsters and he has a wild rumpus time, right? I guess like the whole thing. But there's a moment at the beginning of the book where the word uh, mischievous is used. And I remember being a kid and the first time my mom or my auntie or whoever was reading that book to me and they said the word mischievous and me and me being a kid and being like, you know, first of all, I've never heard that word. What does it mean? Well, you know, what, what does that mean? And then my mom being like, oh, it, or my auntie being like, oh, it means, you know, being a knucklehead or so forth and so on. And I'm like, oh, really? And I remember that word sort of setting off all sorts of sensors in my brain, right? This strange moment of like, an awakening happening because there was this new piece of, of language that now lived in my body, now lived in my mm -hmm. psyche. And it was such a curious word for me that I did everything I could for the next two or three weeks to fit it into the conversation, right? No matter what we're talking about, right? It doesn't matter what it is. It's like, mom was like, all right, tonight you got to eat broccoli. And I'm like, I don't want to be mischievous, right? Or it's like, whatever it is, just trying to figure out ways to put that word in. And all I can think about is what if, what if new language does this, what if we use new language, like we're talking here, words like anti-racism, and there's some, some young person who's just as excited and tries to figure out how to fit it into every conversation. It's a game changer, right? It's a game to think about something very small, very small, because kids, kids I mean, look, we, kids are, are, are curious in the moment that there's something to know and they figure it out. They literally, they run with it. Not only do they run with it, they run with it and tell everybody around them that they should be running with it too. Let me teach you something new. Every young person wants to feel the power of teaching somebody else something that they did not know. It's power in that. We all know that. I mean, you a teacher for a living. You know what it's like to, in that moment where somebody gets it, right? And, and how amazing that feeling is. And I think if we can figure out how to turn all of our young people into, uh, you know, what it felt like for me to hear the word mischievous, except this time around the word anti-racism or around the word racism, <laughs> for that matter. Um, it'd be curious to see how, how the landscape shifts as they get older. Yeah, and I, and I also don't think we should shy away from these conversations and even these types of books with, with young people. I mean, I think most adults know that they struggle to talk about racism most adults know that they are only now really beginning to even understand or even be aware of racism. So can you imagine if you were reading about racism since you were 10 years old, <laughs> you know, since you were 12 years old and you were having these conversations with your peers, with your parents, with your, with your teachers, with your classmates? I mean, can you imagine where you would be at 22 or 32? And, and can you also imagine the way in which developing an anti-racist worldview that sees the racial groups as equals, that, that sees racism as the problem. Can you imagine how that would open up so much for you <laughs> and how much that would protect you? Because you wouldn't grow up thinking that there's something superior or inferior about you because of the color of your skin. And so you won't live with that lie. You won't live with that myth. And then when you're 30, you won't have to start working to overcome sort of 20 years of conditioning that you are superior or that you are inferior or that you don't have privilege. 
Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that like with any other thing we value, the earlier we instill it in our children, the earlier we learn as people, the better and the more we're going to be able to develop it as true sense of self. We really want, you know, young people to, to, to lean into anti-racism as early as possible so they can transform our world. I think, you know, you remember when you were younger, when you when you were a kid, you watched Roots, because I'm sure you watched Roots, because we all had to watch Roots when we were younger. At least I did. Did you, did you watch it? Mm-hmm. Of course you did. We all had to watch it, right? <laughs> but, but I, oh, you know, I, but when I watched Roots, the whole thing, um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing, uh, at the end of it, and I was distraught and sad and scared, my mom was just like, that's how it is. And that was like the wait, I'm like, wait, wait, that's it? That ain't gonna be no conversation around this, no discourse. But for her, there was no conversation to be had. She cause she didn't have the language or information either. For her, it was like, I'm gonna do you a, I'm gonna do you a, a, a service by having you watch this story of, of roots. And in turn, what I learned is I can't be Jason, I gotta be Toby. I gotta be scared, I gotta be shook, I can't be me, right? That like, this is what's coming for me if I try to be me, right? Without any context or explanation to why things are the way they are, right? Because Roots doesn't actually explain any of that. It just shows this sort of moment, <laughs> right? And like all the black people was like, hey, we gonna watch Roots. And all of the kids who watched it was like, so you mean to tell me that when I go outside right now, it might be a white person out there with a hatchet, right? And I might be in trouble, right? And it's like, no, that's not, like there's more to the story, right? And I think it's incumbent upon us as adults to really lean into the moreness, to the moreness of the story. Uh, and I hope that stamp can serve as a as a springboard to do so. And I do want to say, and I know we don't often talk about this part, but I want to say, stamp this this particular version of the book is 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 an appetizer. This is the part of this is a because I, 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 I want to make sure that people realize that when you read this and you feel like you read it and you learned some things, that's the beginning. We we're just starting the conversation, and there's a lot more information for us to continue to delve into. Uh, the stamp senior stamp from the beginning is, is one of those, and there's a ton of uh, of other books um, to to pull from and to learn from, uh, fiction and nonfiction, uh, poetry. There's so much literature for, for for us to read. Definitely, and and everyone, we're gonna start taking and answering questions in a few. So please drop your questions in the comments. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I I agree. I mean, I I think. You know, what, what else what I've been finding, I've seen even many adults who, who've decided to start with stamps, and then they went for stamp to other books on the history of racism um, and or books on, on anti-racism, uh, or they, I've seen so many adults in which their, their teen would be reading stamped and they would be reading stamped from the beginning, and then they were basically able to have conversations about the same sections and the same chapters and the same topics, um, which I, I suspect, you know, were fascinating. I, I, you know, that's something I would have loved to be able to do, to not have written either or not been part of either book and to really, you know, take a, a cousin of mine or, you know, a young one in my family or in my, my, my you know, in my circle and just read it together and, and just to see where those conversations lead. I can only imagine how rich they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see. Do we have any questions yet? I can't, I don't, I don't remember if we told us. But if you I, have any, put them, um, put them in the comments if you have a question. It's funny, it's weird because I can't see anybody. It's like, this one's, it's like, I can't see who's here, obviously. Okay. All right. We have a question. Um, in the book, you bring up the concept of double consciousness. Can you talk more about more about it? And do you feel it is a good or bad thing? <laughs> good or bad is a complicated binary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think it's a complicated thing. I mean, you know, double consciousness, I think, is... Um, at the time, it's weird. Talking about this book has always been, it's always so hard for me because, <laughs> because I try to make sure that I keep the moments that, there it is. Like, <laughs> 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 Bro, 
for someone who is, I mean, the guy on a suit, he's got on, I mean, he's so debonair. I've never seen him not with a suit jacket on. You would think he would have a mug or a regular glass. Or, <laughs> but but uh, no, to answer the question, I think it's tough sometimes because I want to make sure that I contextualize the moments and like I, that the moments that we're discussing also require a bit of context. So do I think double consciousness is good or bad? I think double consciousness at the time when Du Bois was sort of uh, uh, sort of exploring and, and architecting this particular sort of paradigm, I think at the time he he thought that it made that it made sense and that it was and that it was a mm -hmm. you know. And that it wasn't harmful, and that it, that it just was like a reality. It was it was helping black people understand understand the souls of black folk, understand the blackness of who they are, and 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 and, and the truth of where of 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 their of their station in America as both black and American, right? And how that was two different things, uh, as far as he was concerned, and as far as a lot of people thought at that time. Now, do what do I feel about it? I think I think at the end of the day, double consciousness uh, for me um, is. Is is the entryway into assimilationism? I think I think it is the catalyst that because if you because if you can grapple and if you can wreck if you can reckon with it if, or if you can reconcile to double consciousness, then what it basically says is that twoness, right? Pluralism in the way that that uh, and pluralism is okay. By the way, I'm a plural I'm a plural person. I'm a pluralized person, right? There are many parts of me, but the many parts of me make up one authentic whole, right? And so when I talk about pluralism in this context, I'm saying that that the pluralism that comes from wearing the mask, the pluralism that comes from bending and, and, and metamorphosizing into whatever is acceptable for the survival against whiteness, um, is assimilationism in and of itself. Uh, it doesn't mean that it doesn't create safety for some people. So to speak, especially contextualizing that time, but but it it it, it is not anti-racist. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Kendi, correct me if I'm wrong, because by the way, I want y'all to know this is his research. I just be like parroting in his research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm happy you sort of contextualize it because even at the time, you know, he wrote Souls of Black Folk. Well, the book came out, I should say, in in 1903, and it was a radical idea. Uh, in 1903 for a Negro scholar to basically say that we should appreciate being Negro. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was the later sort of construct of, you know, black pride. So he was simultaneously saying, you know, that, that there's this pride in blackness, but then there's also this desire to be an American, which the way it was ultimately framed was, the desire to be white. And, and so even the whole notion of good or bad, there were elements of good and bad in the, in the very theory itself. So I can't even really operationalize it as good or bad. Um, and, and Du Bois himself, by the 1930s, he had started to sort of look back and critique his own double consciousness and had developed a more single consciousness of, of anti-racism. Uh, Let's see, Liv, Liv Roslin asked, while you wrote Stamp from the Beginning, which historical person caused you the most pain? Which caused you the most joy? It's a good question. I think, I think the person who probably called, caused me the most pain was this... Uh, in 1901, which was the same year that Booker T. Washington wrote his classic or published his classic book, Up From Slavery, another black man wrote a book called The American Negro. And it was probably one of the most vicious attacks on black people in the history of American literature. Um, and he may he argue that uh, so anyway I don't really want to get into it and 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 you know I write about that in Stamp from the beginning and and I write about how of course a series of white critics were saying you know he got it right <laughs> and you know uh, he is even more critical to the 
to explaining the Negro problem than Booker T. Washington or W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and, and he was so, black, black people so despised him that they called him the Black Judas. Um, and so he became sort of known as Judas in the black community. Um, and, and, and I think that it, it pains me so because I think it pains me to, to, it pained me to write about people who said that they are black people who said that there were certain things wrong with black people. And no one wrote as viciously about black people than him. Um, I think what brought me the most joy was just probably the, you know, writing about, probably writing about the resistance two racist ideas almost at every point in American history, whether it's you're talking about Ban Benjamin Banneker, who's challenging <laughs> Thomas Jefferson directly, whether you're talking about, you know, Zora Neale Hurston or, or Angela Davis um, or Ida B. Wells, uh, who are challenging the threadbare lie that, uh, you know, the cause of lynchings is, is, is black men raping white women. I think that's really what brought me the most joy, writing about the resistance or the anti-racism. So there's a question by Misty306Q. It says, do you believe the lack of knowledge of famous Black people and their accomplishments contribute to the problem? For example, in literary groups I'm part of, I've asked non-Blacks to mention quotes from famous Black people who aren't athletes or Dr. King or Harriet Tubman. I think that this is how the American educational system was built. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a, it's one of these things where I don't necessarily, like famous black people and their accomplishments contribute to the problem. And it's, it's, it's not, I, I think for me, it's more about the fact that we live in a, we live in a country where the education, where, where, where the education is skewed and what's seen as education is, 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 uh, is sort of distorted and a bit perverse, right? Prime example is just like you said in your, in your circles, the same thing in my circles. I remember I had a buddy of mine in New York to teach at Columbia University. And he said, uh, he said, whenever he would, um, that every now and then he would teach back-to-back uh, -back black books and the students, the white students would, would lose their minds because, <laughs> because they felt like, well, we signed up for an English class, not an African-American literature class. And he's like, well, this is, this is American literature, right? But because their entire educational career up until that point excluded anybody who was black or brown or not white, uh, they believed that that work was less than. Another prime example, I was doing a residency. This is a, a big time, fancy, fancy residency with a bunch of famous poets. And I would come to the workshop every single day with my work ready to have it workshop. And everyone would go around, they would read their poems. And this is like, I won't say their name. A lot of people are famous now, right? They were, these are all these fancy scholars, Harvard, Princeton and all the like. And they're reading their poems and they're critiquing each other. And they're saying, it reminds me of Locke. It reminds me of Pope. It reminds me of Whitman. It reminds me of Ashbery. It reminds, right, they're going down and there. And then when I, the only black person in the program, I would read my poems, they would say, Jason, it feels a little elementary. And the reason why is because they didn't understand the, the, the lineage and tradition in which I was writing from, right? I'm writing from Black Arts, Harlem Renaissance, right? I'm coming up through, through those movements where the work is a little different and, this, and the voice and style and tone of that work is completely different because the context of the people who were writing it was completely different and they had zero education on it. And so instead of asking questions, they said that my work was less than and rudimentary um, you know, and so I think it's just about it's, it's about what we deem as uh, what we deem as 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 accomplishment, what we deem as education, what we deem as literature and art, what we deem at, who we deem as human. Yeah, definitely. So another question asked: When we were students, what did we look for in teachers that made us feel safest and most accepted or comfortable in in our classrooms? I'll say for me, uh, the one thing I didn't want is a teacher trying to be cool. Man, <laughs> there is nothing, there's nothing worse. And for the young people, if there's any young people watching, young folks can tell when you are pretending, you know? And I think my favorite teacher, he was a, a lily white, openly gay man with a strange, uh, stark white bowl haircut 
he wore buttoned up Oxford shirts with fabric ties that were boxed at the end, which I had never seen before. <laughs> and, he, and he wore khaki pants and Jordan and dirty Jordan ones and and silver rings and I had a big hoop silver hoop earring and uh he knew nothing about what it was like to come from my neighborhood and we were a hundred percent certain that he loved us to death right because he was who he was and he taught us things that no other teacher could teach us because he could see us without trying to be us he could see us right he understood that like there were things that he didn't understand and he was willing to engage with us in a certain way and he earned our trust and he changed my life. His name is Mr. Williams, he changed my life. Uh, and so that, that's, I always was looking for the, the teacher that was like, oh, that person just, they are who they are. And, uh, and they care about me enough to be hard on me without being unfair to me. And there's, and I think there's a, there's a line there. So. And I think for me, I think it was teachers that would instill confidence, uh, you know, in, in me. Um, because I was constantly being told by larger society that you know, education and I didn't really mix. And so a teacher that was encouraging me um, was, was critical. I think a teacher who did not view me in the same way that police officers view me as a suspect in their class, in which they're constantly sort of looking for me to misbehave uh, and so but then even the times in which I did instead of them they would ask they would not assume that it's because I have a behavior problem they would ask well what's wrong today is there something you know going on and so that would really affirm my sort of humanity and then also student teachers that not only sort of encouraged and instilled confidence but then also had had I expectations and continuously told me that I could meet them. Mm. There's a question we skip where somebody says, I teach American history, uh, American history revolution through the civil war to seventh graders. Do you have any strategies to discuss anti-racism with students in the classroom, particularly in the context of those times? Um, Dr. Kendi? <laughs> I mean, my only answer is gonna uh, be, my, my only answer would, would just be to tell, t t tell, it, tell the whole story. It's impossible for you to talk about the Civil War. Like it's wide open. If you're talking about the Civil War, it's wide open in terms of a conversation around anti-racism. Well, and and you can talk about, for instance, and I think this is relevant to our time. If you want to specifically talk about anti-racism, you can talk about those who were advocating for reparations during and after the Civil War. You can sort of highlight. Um, those people who are fighting for the civil and voting rights of black people and rejected even abolitionists who were saying they weren't ready for civil and voting rights because they, you know, were brutes just coming out of slavery and they needed to be civilized sort of first. Um, you know, you could chronicle those black communities that developed, you know, in different places and were able to operate and be self-sufficient you know, all by themselves and could have continued to do so if they would have been protected and, uh, and, and, and supported, like Davis Ben, which was the Jefferson Davis, his, who, quote, abandoned his, his land, a bunch of enslaved black people, or newly freed black people basically squatted on it and started planting and were able to essentially build a government and started doing some great things. Or, you know, even the story, I think it became a, uh, a movie of, of, of Jones County, how you had these black and white folks who, who got together to, to sort of um, to, to, to sort of move against the con local confederacy, you know, in the area. I mean, there's so many stories that can certainly be told. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone asked, what's the difference between the content and stamp from the beginning and stamp. Well, this book is better better written. I'll yeah, tell you right. that much. <laughs> man, please. The content. You know what, man? It's. I mean, there's. I couldn't. When I was sort of figuring out this from his original book, 
everything couldn't make the cut. Everything couldn't sort of go in. I mean, this book is, you know, it's not a, it's not a lot of book, right? Um, and so I think that the content that exists in this book is the same content that is his, just not all the content. Uh, and the way that it's sort of delivered um, is different. The style and the tone of it is a little different. Um, his just has more content. It's a more, it's a fuller uh, sort of, you know, it's a fuller swap of our history. This, this is literally sort of like uh, a swatch. You know, it's like, this is like saying, hey, we're gonna take this, we're gonna extract this, and this is gonna be sort of the starter kit for understanding uh, the conversation around race and anti-racism. So. Okay, cool. So the last question, and we'll, we'll get out of here. Uh, from YouTube, someone asked, if we could, if you could add a chapter in this book, especially based on this year, 2020, what would it be titled potentially and what, what would it be about? We could cuss on here. It's like, nah, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Dr. Kendi? I, I, I think that I think it it would be about, I mean, maybe we title it the racial pandemic and we would sort of talk about the pandemic of police and even vigilante violence against black people combined with the pandemic of, of, of black people dying at two and a half times the rates of, of, of white people from, from COVID-19 and how you still have so many people blaming black people for um, dying for their death, as opposed to thinking through and, and looking at the actual forces that are behind this racial pandemic and how so many people are just refusing to even recognize the racial pandemic and that um, we could certainly talk about that. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I mean, it's, it's impossible for that not to be the last chapter, that the, if there was another chapter. Is, is the racial pandemic. It isn't part of me that's like, I, I, I'm, I am curious though. I mean, that would have to be it, but I, I am curious about um, if we wait a little longer, how it all ties into the election. Cause it's gonna be a, that's the, that's the triangulation, right? Like the last point of the triangle for 2020 is gonna be the election. So it's, it's COVID and it's, and it's police killings and it's the election. And I think those three things, um, sheesh, it's just, yeah. I'm not gonna curse, Barnes and Nick, the Barnes and Noble staff, go ahead. <laughs> nah, I, I'm good. I want to, but it's okay. You know, it's all right. Everybody knows what, everybody knows what they call it. You know, yeah. <laughs> everybody knows what they, everyone knows what word we don't have to use for it, you know? <laughs> and, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, you know. Cool. Well, so, yeah. well Everyone, thank you so much for uh, for taking some time with us. You know, please, please get the book if you don't have it already from from Barnes and Noble online, um, and you know, buy it for a friend and make sure you're having these conversations with with young people. Yeah, man. Buy it for your classroom. Buy it for your library. Buy it for your mama. Y'all be safe out there. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Stop being racist. <laughs> we holler at y'all in the next one. All right, cool. I'm going to buy you a water bottle, bro. I'm going to buy you a... Uh, <laughs> <laughs>